dummies might help defeat the enemy, but in contemporary warfare, big weapons, big planes, and big vehicles rule the battlefield. But almost 100 years ago, in World War I, opposing sides dug in deep and battled from the trenches. It was a slow process. Then, in 1915, something new emerged that would change warfare forever. That something was the tank. Tanks in general are, are awesome because here you have this, this moving fortress of steel coming across the battlefield carrying all its firepower. Most tanks of the time weighed less than 30 tons to stay agile. But one leader thought bigger was better. Tsar Nicholas II of Russia saw these awesome tanks and wanted one. But he figured that if a 30-ton tank was good, then a super tank would be even better. Old boys like toys, and big boys like big toys. The Russian tank would be the biggest and baddest tank ever constructed. Appropriately enough, its name was the Tsar tank, and its design would be revolutionary. Most tanks have tracks across battlefield terrain, but tracks slow you down. The top speed of the British Mark I tank at the time was just four miles an hour. A man could walk faster. The Russians not only wanted it to be big, it also had to be fast. Really fast. So they had a brilliant idea. But there was a problem. Wheels can get stuck in the rough terrain of a battlefield. To overcome this, the engineers had an idea. Think big. As these simple demonstrations show, small wheels have real problems when confronted by rough terrain. But big wheels don't. The Tsar tank is just uh, a crazy sort of, almost a mutant tricycle in a lot of ways. And the Russians didn't hold back. They made the front wheels 30 feet in diameter, five times taller than a man. There was not one, but three gun turrets mounted on the top and the side. Two massive engines provided 500 horsepower. It would crush everything in its path. In August 1915, the Star Tank was ready for its first trial. In a secret forest location outside Moscow, a demonstration began in front of an audience of top Russian generals. The monster tank was unstoppable. In the testing process, they drove this into a forest and it crushed the forest. But then, something happened. The tank hit a patch of soft, muddy ground and immediately bogged down. How could this have happened? Surely this is what the gigantic wheels were designed for. But there was a basic law of physics they'd forgotten. The tank was so huge that it weighed 40 tons, more than a fully loaded semi-trailer. It was too much for the mutant tricycle. Once it got stuck, it never moved again. It remained in place for years until someone came along and, and, and literally cut it up for scrap.
big wheels might not work, but in the mind of a homicidal lunatic, big guns were bound to be a winner. So it should come as no surprise that in World War II, Adolf Hitler set out to build the biggest gun in history. World War II saw warfare get even bigger and weirder, thanks to the Nazis. In 1943, they began constructing a colossal bunker near the coast of France, not too far from Britain. The mammoth structure was 73 feet high and 38 feet deep, with walls up to 16 feet thick, made entirely out of concrete. If it worked, it would launch 36 V-2 rockets every single day. It came to be known as Le Blockhouse. The Allies immediately mobilized massive bombing raids against the blockhouse. But the bunker was specifically designed to resist conventional bombs that exploded above ground. Explosions which happen above ground produce an air blast. To demonstrate the air blast, our explosives expert is setting a charge which replicates what happens when you drop a bomb on top of a bunker. It's called a shockwave and results in an extremely rapid rise in temperature and pressure. All that energy is absorbed by the bunker's walls, which are thick enough to withstand the blast. Despite the power of the explosion, the effect is minimal. The question for the Allies was how to destroy a massive bunker specially designed to repel attacks from above. They needed someone who could think weird. They found him. His name was Barnes Wallace. Barnes Wallace was an absolutely unique thinker. He was an aircraft designer, but he also designed the bouncing bomb. A bomb that bounces on water. Now that's our kind of engineer. Barnes Wallace realized that he could achieve the same effect if he somehow managed to bury his bomb under the blockhouse. Rather than let the bomb explode above ground, what you do is you let it go underground. Earth is much denser than air, so it transmits a much more powerful punch directly to the foundations of the building. A mini earthquake. By providing that shake, you may be able to bring the whole building down on itself in one go. But the Allies couldn't exactly sneak into occupied France and start digging an enormous hole under one of the most fortified buildings in the world. So Barnes Wallace came up with a brilliantly offbeat idea an absolutely massive self-tunneling mine. Tall Boy was the world's weirdest bomb. Its tip was made of heavily armored steel. It was put into a specially modified bomber designed to carry its weight and drop from four miles high. That gave the bomb time to accelerate to more than 2,500 miles per hour, more than three times the speed of sound. Its hardened nose would tunnel deep into the ground. Then it would explode. 
creating a miniature earthquake that would bring LeBlanc House crashing down. Barnes Wallace had created a bomb that you could drop from below. Now, it was time to put it into practice. June 19, 1944. A heavily modified Lancaster bomber from RAF 617 Squadron flies over the channel with Tallboy on board. Destination, La Block House. The Germans don't suspect a thing. The bomb enters the ground and as Wallace predicted, sets off a mini earthquake. The mission is a success. La Block House is damaged beyond repair. And the V-2 rockets are put out of commission for good. Today, earthquake bombs are called bunker busters. And they're still in use by the U.S. Air Force. The V-2 rocket launcher wasn't the only plan the Nazis had for attacking the UK. It is 1943. The industrial heartland of Nazi Germany is being pounded by Allied bombers. Hitler's Air Force, the Luftwaffe, have not been able to effectively counter the attack. It's not looking good for Germany. Hitler now wants a wonder weapon that can reach across the channel. A super cannon that can fire shells at London from occupied France. 100 miles away. Hitler was a megalomaniac. He, he was really quite a bit mad. In Hitler's case, that was married with a really almost pathological belief that he knew better than his own general, that he knew better than his own scientists. To keep him happy, Nazi engineers came up with something really monstrous. The barrel alone would be 490 feet long, twice as long as a jumbo jet. To maximize range, it needed an angle of 45 degrees. So to support its weight, it had to be dug into the ground. To power the shell all the way to London, over 100 miles away, they fitted rocket boosters along the barrel. As the shell went past each booster, the explosive push increased its speed. The shells would leave the barrel at more than 3,300 miles per hour, twice as fast as a jet fighter. They would hit London within two minutes. And unlike a bomb or a missile, you wouldn't hear it coming. They called it the V-3 Supercut. By March 1944, it was almost ready to wipe out Britain. But a gun this big is really tricky to hide. Everybody notices. The French resistance notices, the locals notice, and they notify the British and Americans who immediately start going after it. They waited until it was almost built, and then they used a 12,000 pound bomb to take it out. Those bombs were more of Barnes Wallace's tall boys. Hitler's super gun was a super sitting duck. In the 20th century, the most vital fields of conflict disappeared from sight and hid in the shadows. This is the story of war fought with hidden microphones, noxious chemicals, exploding...